Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last uh, session of uh, Reinforcement Learning Reading Club in 2021. Uh, in this uh, session, we will be reading uh, uh, a paper from uh, Sugraf Asia, and uh, the presenter will be Nam He Gordon Kim. Uh, Nam uh, has recently started uh, his PhD uh, in the Department of Computer Science at Alton University. So, Nam, feel free to start. Hey, thanks, Samin, for that intro. Welcome to my talk. Um, by the way, if you have any questions, please feel free to pause um, and just, you know, shout your questions, unmute your mic or raise your hand, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, also, feel free to turn on your webcams if you're somehow hiding your faces. Uh, I would. I, I like talking to people, not to the artificial void. Anyways, <laughs> uh, okay, let's talk about what we see here in this picture. So I'll start over here at the bottom. Um, the yellow uh, is, you know, what we call the trained uh, character that are, you know, being deployed in the um, in the dynamic environment, uh, and then the green thing that you see is the reference trajectory. Um, that the character is trying to mimic, okay? So in more details, uh, here's the next slide. The reference motion is the green thing being shown and then the actuated trajectory is what you see in the yellow. Uh, and um, they visualize the tail. I think it's a bit noisy, but you can sort of see uh, the tracking performance is pretty consistent um, across the environment steps. And then the second uh, picture you see is, again, the yellow thing is the expert controller's uh, trajectory, but the red thing that you see is the autoregressive output that the so-and-so called um, world model is outputting uh, based on the one state at a certain time step and then roll it out um, based on its own assumption about the environment dynamics. Uh, and then you see without much training, uh, at first the world model output is garbage, but as you train this model more, um, you are able to match the environment dyna dynamics with the learned dynamics. So uh, all of these terms I will uh, unpack in the next few uh, minutes or so. Uh, any questions before I move on to uh, the next slide? I see a few more people rolling in, welcome, welcome. Um, and then another thing that I sort of forgot to mention is that the red um, visual that you see in the teaser image is the rollout, the autoregressive rollout, according to uh, the world model's assumption about the environment dynamics. And uh, you might be familiar with how dynamics can accrue uh, larger and larger error as you try to predict longer horizons of motion and you can kind of see that artifact happening the dog character after let's say like 60 frames of predictions or so uh, auto regressively you start seeing artifacts where the tail looks weird and this is sort of uh, what's expected uh, and you might call this the error in the uh, world model prediction not a big big deal but it's something that is incorporated into the optimization in this paper so without further ado let's just go to the bottom uh, line up front so our problem is motion tracking. Motion tracking refers to taking an input reference motion that's just purely kinematic, just joint positions or angles, okay? And then what we want is an agent that can navigate physically simulated world. And um, in that world, we want the agent to mimic this reference motion and it's physically based. Um, so it can adapt to any sort of dynamic stimuli being provided uh, in, the, um, in the inference time. And the current knowledge gaps in the motion tracking field is that uh, model-free reinforcement learning is used uh, all the time, but it has limitations mostly in terms of sample efficiency because it's an on-policy optimization, um, as well as you know many other um, you know many other issues that come with just you know deep reinforcement learning in general, like value estimation problem, uh, catastrophic catastrophic forgetting. I think that's what the term was. So on and so forth. And then there's not much use of model-based reinforcement learning. So model-free reinforcement learning does not take advantage of the uh, differentiable model of the world's dynamics. Um, and now let's try and estimate that uh, by using a neural network is the main contribution of this paper. 
uh, well, it's not a novel contribution, but they, they leverage that uh, in making a training algorithm. So their solution is to, as I said, uh, create a model-based learning. And this is not necessarily reinforcement learning. This, this is just supervised learning uh, with learn dynamics. And this learn dynamics model is what is called the world model. So I'll use the term world model from now on. And in their uh, in algorithmic approach, they use motion tracking as supervised learning approach. So um, the basically losses are back propagated to the policy instead of trying to uh, find these peaks in the reward landscape. And also uh, another cool thing they use is using learn dynamics as approximate differentiable simulator. So I, I've said a lot of things. So uh, before um, I go further into it, let's watch this video together at 1.5 times speed and I will answer some primitive or sorry, preliminary questions. Um, I think I need to share sound, share sound. We present a method of motion tracking for physically simulated characters, which can produce high quality tracking results on large. Oops, sorry. We present a method of motion tracking for physically simulated characters, which can produce high quality tracking results on large animation databases and interactive kinematic controllers. Recent work has largely relied on optimizing motion capture tracking policies using imitation rewards and model-free reinforcement learning algorithms, such as PPO. We instead formulate the problem as one which can be solved using supervised learning. Given a state S and a target kinematic state K, a policy outputs a control target T. A black box simulator receives S and T as input, and information about the current step is saved to a sampling buffer. The next state, produced by the simulator, is fed back as input, and the result is saved. This process is repeated until a sufficient amount of data has been gathered. The buffer is then sliced. A slice of data from the buffer can be visualized as an unrolled sequence of repeated computations with an initial and terminal state. A differentiable model of the dynamics, which we call the world model, will be trained to approximate the unrolled slices. The world model makes a sequence of state predictions P based on the initial state of the slice and the associated sequence of control targets. A loss function is formulated from the sum of the magnitude of prediction errors, and the weights of the neural network representing the world model are optimized using backpropagation on the unrolled sequence in order to compute gradients. Next, during policy optimization, the rollout associated with the slice is approximated using the world model in place of the sim. This allows gradients of a loss with respect to policy parameters to be computed. The policy network weights are optimized directly to improve tracking performance. Policy and world model improvement are repeated iteratively with longer rollouts than those shown here. The character shown here is physically simulated and controlled by a policy trained using our method. The policy tracks the target kinematic state, shown in green. We can visualize the past states using a trail of poses. Note that root transform drift is allowed, but if we align everything using the first pose in the sequence, we can visualize the tracking performance of the policy more clearly. Hiding the target kinematic states, we can also visualize the quality of the world model predictions. The first simulated state in the sequence is fed as input to the world model, and a series of predictions are made through an autoregressive rollout of world model evaluations. As we can see, the predictions of the world model approach the true outcome of the simulation closely, providing an accurate, differentiable simulation. Because our method directly optimizes the policy to improve on sampled actions rather than through shifting a distribution using trial and error, we achieve high sample efficiency and training speeds. Our method is also less sensitive to hyperparameter settings and can be applied with the same settings to many different large datasets and tracking setups. For example, our method produces a policy that succeeds on a large variety of complex motions and contact configurations when trained on this 6.5 hour dataset. It is also possible to train with the same settings on different characters, such as this dog. Additionally, by pre-recording a database of motion from an interactive kinematic controller, such as motion matching, we can train policies specifically for interactive use. The human and dog characters shown here are user-controlled in real time. We can also train a policy on large databases of animation that include hours of athletic motion over rough terrain. This results in a policy capable of traversing more varied environments. Finally, we compare our method to PPO in three different popular physics engines. All policies are given 20 hours of training on a very large animation database. PPO struggles to produce a high-quality policy on this difficult task. In conclusion, we show a method of motion tracking using supervised learning that produces high quality motion using an internal model of the simulator dynamics to directly optimize the policy via backpropagation. Thanks for watching. Okay, um, continuing on. So, okay, so that's sort of the introduction to the, uh, uh, the, the whole talk that I prepared today. So for the next uh, 30 minutes, um, this is sort of my agenda. 
Um, if you have any questions or comments or interjection, I welcome them at any time. So please uh, don't feel shy. Uh, you can also use the raise hand function or type something in the chat and I'll be monitoring it myself. Um, okay, so let's talk about where we are in the world of motion tracking with reinforcement learning. And what is motion tracking? So you might be familiar with this work um, by Jason Peng and colleagues. Uh, this is called Deep Mimic, uh, sort of a seminal work that started it all in the reinforcement learning world. All you want to do is just uh, have a policy that is trained to mimic um, the reference motion uh, that is taken as an input. And usually you, uh, you know, explicitly give the features of this reference trajectory into the policy. So the policy can uh, learn to map its actions to what gives it the highest, like reward, uh, highest reward in terms of how closely it's mimicking the kinematic trajectory. One useful um, thing about motion tracking is that it gives, it constrains the, uh, you know, the solution space uh, that um, only makes sense in human eyes, for example, you know, if you don't have a reference motion and ask a policy to run, it might develop a visually very weird motion, although it's valid. Uh, so to sort of prune these solutions and to only output what's really believable. That's one way uh, motion tracking is very useful. And another thing that's sort of uh, intuitive is because we are outputting a physically based policy, it can adapt, uh, adapt to dynamic interactions uh, within the physically simulated environment, such as, you know, if you throw boxes at this running, uh, running character, it is able to recover from these perturbations uh, thanks to to, uh, having this robust control logic that is the neural network policy. Okay, so uh, motion tracking is not uh, super, super new, although uh, I, I argue that the work that started, it all uh, started in 2018. And then since then, a lot of uh, methods are uh, trying to solve this motion tracking problem by designing more efficient uh, reinforcement learning algorithms using, um, you know, more uh, numerically stable slash, you know, more efficient uh, reward functions, for example. Uh, but most work has been in limited to you know building up reinforcement learning algorithms themselves rather than sort of uh, thinking outside the box and treating this as a separate problem as re uh, reinforcement learning um yeah so that's motion tracking i hope that's not confusing um and now I'm gonna talk about world model so what's world model it's also known as the learned dynamics because you're I guess, learning the dynamics of the environment. So here's a mental exercise, very, very easy mental exercise. Let's say we're playing the Super Mario, okay? And um, here's me, and I press this jump button, okay? Without playing the game, I can imagine what it looks like if I press the jump button, oh, what what is the uh, state of the world gonna look like, okay? So you think about it and you kind of picture, okay, Mario is going to jump up and it's, um, you know, the character is going to be here or something like that, right? So you imagine, you imagine what the outcome looks like, um, you know, after you apply this action. So that is your imagination or your dream or your world model. Of course, it doesn't... Uh, always match the true state of the world after simulation. So in this case, I, uh, I say, okay, well, the, the Mario is jumping a bit further uh, than what you thought. So there is a mismatch between what you think is gonna happen and what actually happens. So there's that prediction error between the predicted next state versus the actual next state. Uh, so in the, in the um, vocabulary of this paper, uh, they use these symbols. The current state is the uh, S of T, and then the intervention or the action is the capital T of T. Uh, and then the predicted next state is a P, and then the, you know, the actual next state is S T plus one. Uh, and then there's an error that can back propagate to the control policy. Uh, and that's sort of the main idea behind the uh, algorithm. So I'll, I'll, I'll provide um, more structured overview in the next few slides. Before that, the history on the world model is, um, you know, Jürgen Schmidt, who, who basically invented everything about AI back in the 80s and 90s, also invented world model 
according to himself. Um, and uh, since then, you know, learning the world's dynamics um, has been used a lot in graphics and uh, control uh, and, you know, dynamics literature. Uh, more recently, um, this 2018 paper called, you know, World Models with RNN, forget the exact paper, paper title, but was uh, very, very seminal in how um, the world model rollouts, um, you know, drastically improve learning efficiency without really using the simulation themselves uh, for reinforcement learning. And then more recently, um, this is my own work from 2020, uh, where I also use supervised learning with world models to put different uh, characters uh, performing similar tasks into correspondence. All right, I said a lot of things, uh, so let's pause here. Let me drink some water. And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to shout it out. Okay, I guess I can just move on to method summary. Let's not spend too much time here, maybe five minutes max, and then we will talk about results. Uh, so what's motion tracking? In the abstract sense, uh, this is how I picture it. So on the x-axis, I have progression of time. And on the y-axis, I have space of poses or you know state space, if you will. And then what's a reference motion? It's, um, it's a curve that lives on this space-time um, surface. And uh, you know the data basically gives you this curve that you can track. And what you want to do is to um, create a function that can output this actuated trajectory over time, okay? So that's uh, essentially motion tracking. Your error is, you know, this vertical distance between the yellow curve and the green curve uh, saying, well, how far my actuated trajectory is off from the given reference motion. And uh, one thing to notice that my trajectory, the yellow trajectory is actuated, so it's still the um, outcome or consequence of applying actuations to the virtual motors equal to the character rather than just purely trying to mimic the you know, trajectory kinematically. So in the reinforcement learning approach like deep mimic, um, this tracking error was indirectly measured by using a reward function. So why do we really need that reward term? Why not minimize the tracking error uh, directly by a gradient descent? Uh, if we can measure the difference between the two, then can't we just uh, make the yellow curve directly match the green curve? And the problem is that the simulators are not generally differentiable. And even if simulators are differentiable, um, the memory constraints can be quite large. So um, following this large like 60 seconds, 80 seconds of trajectory and trying to back propagate through the errors uh, accumulated in the sequence is not computationally very feasible. Okay, so that's the um, sort of big idea about motion tracking. And here's the contributions uh, of the SuperTrack paper, where if you have a snapshot of the world model, so you have your current understanding of how the environment dynamics works, then based on that, based on that, you can try to track this reference motion by imagining what your actuated trajectory looks like instead of having to actually roll out the simulated, um, simulated trajectory. So I have this approach approximate actual trajectory. And the same deal, you can uh, quantify the tracking areas, the vertical distance between the two. In this case, you can back propagate into uh, the policy, the yellow curve can be forced to make, um, make the yellow curve can be forced to look like the green curve because now um, through the dynamics, uh, you can, you can uh, propagate the gradients back to the policy. And then uh, secondly, given the current policy snapshot, we can try and improve the world model's accuracy. So what if uh, my actual trajectory looked like this green curve and my world model was not accurate. So my Mario was jumping way far forward uh, instead of jumping where it was supposed to be. So we can uh, also correct the current understanding of how the world works and then essentially use alternating optimization between the two to to improve the accuracy of the world model and improve the performance of the policy in a two-handed manner. All right, and of course, this error is also um, optimized by uh, supervised learning. 
Okay, so I said a bunch of things, but I think I, I say if you understand this abstract visual, uh, you understand the meat of the method and rest is just formal details. And I'm gonna gloss over all of that. So uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. I will take another sip of this water. So, so if I understood correctly, so the first, the first training mechanism. Uh, so, I, I'm trying to figure out how where the reinforcement learning jumps in. So, none of these, I guess, are related to to our L directly, at least, right? Uh, yeah. So, I guess the only semblance you have uh, with reinforcement learning is that there is. Uh, episode rollout involved in each iteration of optimization. So this blue thing still involves simulation, but it's not trying to give you reward signals. It's just so that you can um, you can optimize the world model. Yeah, right, yeah. Thanks. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I guess it's more like related to like planning, you could say. Uh, so you kind of uh, imagine in your head and then try to, to optimize based on your imagination. Yeah, yeah. so model-based model learning, I guess, because, yeah, um, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, back in like um, 2016, 2017, you know, you would do the same thing, except um, you don't do the sequential uh, execution in the policies. How, how should I put it? Like you would, you would usually like, you know, not have an explicit policy, but use an MPC or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, what are choices for world models? Um, I think they talk about the specific architectures, but I'm not really interested in the architecture, so I didn't note that. Sorry about uh, sorry about missing that detail, but I bet it's like 256, 256, uh, just MLPs. I think they're usually good enough for control. Does that answer your question? Uh, I, I don't know if your name is pronounced correctly, Mohamed Reza. Okay, thank you. Moving forward. Okay, so again, I'm gonna gloss over the details, um, but here's just uh, repeating the exact same information in prettier pictures. Um, let's take the current state of my character along with the action um, for the character. Uh, and then, sorry, not action, uh, the, the target pose for the character, and then the policy will output an action that's hopefully matching um, the current character's pose to the input target pose. Uh, and then the, you know, the rollout can happen in two different ways. Uh, one way is to use the world model, just, you know, your imagined dynamics to roll out the character states, or uh, actually use physically based simulators to, to get actual true trajectory, and then you can compute the error between the two uh, in an autoregressive fashion uh, like this. So, Given a policy snapshot, what you're going to do is, um, you know, first, what we do is gather um, gather the trajectory data, okay? So uh, given, given, given the trajectory data, what you do is this. You, you look at the world model's output and then compare that to the true, ground true, um, you know, uh, next state and then autoregressively use the prediction into the world model to get the next time steps prediction and then use the prediction to um, as an input to get the next time step. So just use prediction upon prediction upon prediction. And then the error is computed in this like sequential manner. You you get the you know prediction error for time step one, prediction error for time step two, all the way to the end of the window. So all of that is going to be uh, optimized together to get an accurate world model. Uh, and then to optimize your policy, what you do is instead of using a, a simulator, you use the world model, imagine what your state looks like, and then use this auto regressively again. Use the imagined state, use the imagined state, use the imagined state. And the good thing is that since my W is a neural network, the output is a differentiable tensor. So if I compute the error based on the output of the W at any time, you are able to compute uh, you know, the back propagation from uh, this error term. So again, do this for yay many steps in the window and then um, you know, perform back propagation to uh, optimize the policy output such that um, such that the world model output matches 
my target um, target kinematic uh, pose. Yes, I'm in. Uh, yes. So uh, when the training starts, does the uh, world model is like fully untrained, or, or is it like? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I th I think so. I think when the training starts, I think they train the world model first. And then uh, you know yeah once you once you have uh, you know non nonsense world model uh, then then you would uh, start training the policy but yeah again alternating optimization you have to roll it for like two hours for it to get anything sensible okay uh, let's take a look at uh, how they pre-process the information so I, I I thought this was a value information that wasn't highlighted very well, but the state information is like what you would expect in any sort of RL settings, you know, the degrees of freedom is like, you know, the, the, the 3D pose of um, each rigid body basically in the global coordinate, but they say, okay, global coordinate on its own can't uh, really uh, estimate sort of any sort of a contact constraints in the world model. So what you need is local coordinates and the root coordinates. So uh, actually based on this state information, they pre-process use, use a sort of a standard graphics uh, and robotics tricks to figure out the local coordinates for the rotations in quaternions and um, and the positions. So I'm I'm not very well versed in um, you know rigid body transformations. So this was a bit dense uh, thing to read. But I thought, oh, maybe a lot of the you know tracking failures uh, in the past would have been addressed if you you know appropriately localize your state features, etc. Okay, so. Again, glossing over all the details in the method, please read the paper. The method section is actually quite simple if you know the standard tricks, um, but I'm not gonna spend more time into this, okay? Uh, any other questions here? So, so how do they, so how do you actually implement this rolling, like uh, rolling the gradients? Uh, so is it like a recurrent neural net or just a simple MLP? I'm not. I'm not very sure. I think simple MLP will still be able to receive gradients from multiple time steps. It's just you know you can think of having multiple reward, uh, multiple loss terms. So there shouldn't be anything preventing mm. just one update to the policy. It, it's not performing multiple updates for, for the whole rollout. There's only one update, I think. Oh, okay. So you can treat uh, like normally as you do in reinforcement learning, you mean? Uh, yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Except that it's through, you know, back propagation through the differentiable physics. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Let's see and if I can get through the results section in like 10 minutes or so. Uh, so I, I showed you the teaser. So uh, you probably are convinced that uh, tracking performance is good enough. Um, really like uh, interesting bits that I saw was the rough terrains and like on Twitter, uh, Daniel Holden made it a big deal about the <laughs> Uh, the paper, but I realize now uh, the contribution isn't much on top of what's already there. So what they do is, oh, like say our method scales to more difficult navigation environments. So, you know, if you use traditional PPO uh, or whatever, and you try to train it on these environments, then it'll fail. Deep Mimic would fail to do this, okay? So, okay, I, 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 I am sold. I am sold that your model is performant enough to track motions in, you know, rough terrains, but uh, isn't, this overfitting, you know, uh, there's no generalization of uh, terrain navigation. So that was really disappointing to me, actually. So all they do is train on reference terrain navigation motions and they replicate the terrain that was seen in the training data. So, uh, you know, as, as, as I, in my opinion, as long as your tricks are like, you know, well aligned and uh, it's not surprising that your model works here. Uh, but how is this really useful? You know, you're Ubisoft and you want your, you know, character to be performing 
this online, you know, control, and then, you know, you want to climb this mountain or, you know, climb this hill and you see this like height field and you haven't seen this height field in the training set. So how are you going to um, track it? So I thought, okay, maybe there's some sort of variations involved and there's robustness to the height field variations, but they don't talk about any of that in the paper. Uh, so that's why I was sort of ticked off. Um, so how is this useful? Shrug. Um, by the way, so when I talk about rough terrains and continuous terrain navigation, the original motion tracking paper at Deep Mimic, this was a complete like zero shot um, deployment. So this 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 robot character only learned to walk forward, and you give it a stair. Then to your surprise, it's gonna start walking up the stairs without like any any additional fine tuning. So that was actually pretty huge. Like uh, just walking forward is enough to induce stair climbing. And then uh, again, like last year's uh, SCA paper uh, that I published with my colleagues, you know, we we did have generalized terrain navigation through you know trying to. Uh, predict the next two steps um, that are uh, important for you know navigation, so on and so forth. Okay, I'm, I'm I'm ranting, but I thought this is their biggest contribution, but turns out it's not. So that docked a lot of points uh, for me. Uh, yeah, it was very interesting point. <laughs> yeah, I realized it before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so next thing, uh, again, Daniel Holden hyped this up in on his Twitter, uh, understandably to people who are not super well versed in the previous uh, work. So he says, okay, like interactive control, uh, our, our method is so good at scales. Um, so what, what you do is you, uh, you know, collect the basically kinematic data that is uh, mapping the character poses to the controller input or the you know heading for the character and if you um, you know use these controls as goal features during reinforcement learning um, then you are able to use it in the inference time when you deploy the physically simulated character and you give it a heading direction as a goal then it you know it not only tracks the reference motion, but also changes heading. This is not actually new at all. Um, and it's been done many times in RL, especially in Daniel Holden's old lab at Edinburgh uh, with um, their, 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 their other things. So it's nothing new, but it was so hyped up. And uh, I was a bit disappointed because I thought, oh, like it's going to be so cool. Like you're going to give controller input to the dog character and it's going to start climbing the uh, height field um, of a sort. But looks like that's far away from reality. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more work in this direction. Okay, uh, quantitatively, I, I say, oh, it's, 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 it's non-arguable that their method is very good. Uh, numerically, very stable and performant and computationally efficient. So PPO uh, just gets blown out of the water. Uh, so, just to unpack the visual a little bit, what they show is how good uh, SuperTrack is compared to PPO in terms of training performance. So they give PPO and SuperTrack a um, bunch of data sets to train on for motion tracking. And then now I, I train my super track agents and then I'm gonna run a lot of um, you know episodes and see after 30 seconds, okay, after 30 seconds, how many of my episodes have not failed, okay? And obviously, if you have super, super difficult motions in your data set, then maybe tracking is going to be very difficult, right? But uh, as you see, SuperTrack uh, has much more, you know, gray, gradually decreasing performance compared to uh, PPO, even when the motion is like the hardest to track, um, which I think here it's because you are doing uh, transfer, not transfer, actually, just generalization performance. Um, but anyways, their like their worst survival is actually better than many of their best survival in the PPOs. So, which was nice. Uh, you know, it, it, it's 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 non-debatable that uh, SuperTrack could do better survivals, especially for these three data sets. They have a near hundred percent survival rate for um, the episodes, uh, and then for generalization performances, uh, as you see. If you train on one data set and deploy onto the other, so tra uh, train to track one data set's motions and then give it a new data set to track, um, then 
uh, surprisingly, um, SuperTrack does really, really well in this performance while PPO completely gives up. I don't think it's because PPO is not performant. I think it's because uh, if you train it for 40 hours, uh, because SuperTrack is more time efficient, uh, you know, SuperTrack ends up performing better. Anyways. Uh, and uh, in terms of wall time, PPO uh, is also inferior here. Uh, as you can see, X axis, you have progression of time. Y axis is like uh, sort of measure of how good your trajectories are after yay much time of uh, training. So across different random seeds, you see uh, super track uh, having really, really nice performance and still um, sort of growing. PPO is growing for sure, but it is growing very slowly. So maybe you t you need like 200 hours or so for it to fully converge. Um, and then if you use different sort of loss uh, scales uh, and like, you know, if you, if you change your loss functions or hyperparameters a little bit, um, then how well does your agent do? And then they say, okay, our super track thing um, is more robust to these in a minuscule hyperparameter tuning. You don't have to worry about it. Just use your intuition, you know, use three minus four for learning rate. I don't care. And then it ends up uh, doing as well as the baseline. Um, and then also lastly, they show that, you know, the super track uh, results are not just for, you know, their phys X engine. It's also for Havoc and Bullet uh, for all of these uh, physics simulators. It's doing pretty darn well. Uh, I think this is last before another pause. So um, uh, transfer learning is also kind of a big, uh, you know, topic in learning literature and worm starting your policies and uh, world models tend to perform much better than just trying to learn everything from scratch, which makes sense. So you see the green curve um, is that that's doing super well, right? Uh, it, it takes only like half an hour, an hour to start just outperforming um, the, the baseline transfer. And then you end up seeing this one does much better than the yellow curve and the red curve in the long run as well, um, because now you have started with um, you know pretty good understanding of how dynamics works and you know what 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 are sort of the primitive uh, motions that you can do to track various motions, uh, as opposed to just training from scratch. Nice thing to see is uh, even if you didn't have access to the motion tracking policies, but you have an understanding of the dynamics, then you can still leverage this from the get-go and have a really, really nice learning boost um, happening pretty early on. Okay. All right, I said a lot of words, so I'm gonna stop here and take, take uh, questions if there's any. Okay, crickets. Uh, we'll talk about my analysis and we'll go into just sort of a round table discussion. So uh, as for the work, um, I think it is a huge breakthrough for motion tracking uh, and eliminating certain limitations of model-based, oh, sorry, model-free reinforcement learning is a very huge breakthrough for me. So uh, algorithmic contribution is huge. Um, one thing that they didn't really focus on is how they get rid of value estimation and reward maximization, which are sort of the theoretical uh, you know, difficulties in reinforcement learning. Um, and then getting rid of these, uh, you can solely focus on the tracking performance as well as the world models prediction performance, thus enabling true supervised learning. Um, and uh, in terms of their uh, exposition, I think the you know it, it, it is very clear that PPO is blown out of the water uh, compared to SuperTrack. Um, it, it it beats PPO in wall time and tracking performance uh, in nearly just every single task that it's given. And also, it's surprisingly cost efficient. Uh, you know, they uh, according to their graph, I am yet to try this on my local machine, uh, but only 
two hours of training might be enough on a six core six core CPU with a relatively like mid tier graphics card. Um, and then the, I think the qualitative results in this work was really nice, uh, very catchy uh, and very beautiful. And Daniel Holden's a big believer in qualitative results. So not a big surprise there. Uh, implementation wise, you know, I mean, uh, Mohamed Reza was asking about, uh, you know, the, the neural net uh, architecture here. Uh, I think there's, there's a, you know, no reason for me to say 256 by 256 wouldn't work because it's again, just uh, mapping from the state to action. So relatively simple task. So that's kind of out of the way. And then, uh, you know, uh, implementing this off policy, uh, you know, supervised learning also seems pretty straightforward enough uh, if you are well-versed in the RL uh, literature. And also uh, the data that they provided, at least the LaFon data, uh, I think they released this back in 2020 um, and it's accessible. So if you want to replicate their study, I think this actually gives a huge boost in terms of confidence in the method. Um, some of the things that ticked me off is that they, they, they solely dedicate their paper for tearing down PPO. Uh, so is, is, is it a good baseline? Well. You know, they actually use a, something completely different. They use uh, model-based learning, off-policy learning, and not even the reinforcement learning. So they're comparing all of these uh, sort of a theoretically out of distribution method to the you know very classic uh, deep reinforcement learning algorithm. So they're 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 from two different families. Aren't aren't you comparing apples to oranges here? So I I'm, I don't have an answer whether it's fair or not. But I was sort of confused whether you know if if, if they're uh, attacking a straw man here. Uh, and then again, I think the algorithmic contributions were really nice, but. Uh, I think application wise, I was putting pretty high hopes into what uh, you know it could do in the interaction time, but uh, it still seems limited. Um, and especially given that Daniel Holden uh, bothered to put up a pretty catchy uh, Twitter post about their uh, you know Turing navigation and interactive control. Uh, and some some writing nits again some lack of details on these like what seem to be pretty pretty big breakthrough but you know when you open the when you open the what do you call the the, the gift wrap and uh, it's sort of disappointing what's inside um, and also they do admit uh, all of these auto regressive methods are only limited for a short term tax so if if you want to do you know long term trajectory planning uh, just using their model just using their methods out of the box is not going to be a good idea okay so my score is a weak except fun fact i gave it a strong except um, I, I'm not a reviewer, but if I were a SIGGRAPH reviewer, I would have given it a strong accept, but I read the paper again and decided it's um, ticked me off too much on that rough terrain navigation, so I give it a weak accept instead. Okay, so that's all the talk I prepared for today, so I am going to stop talking. Uh, let's, let's have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nam. It was really interesting. And uh, yeah, I really feel like I also need to read the paper in more details. So, and we still have about uh, 13 minutes of discussion time. So, if anyone has questions, uh, feel free to ask. So, I haven't done much on model based reinforcement learning. So could you explain like how you would imagine the, you know, the imagination part of the world, I guess, like, that would be from a neural network, the output or? Um, one one classic uh, application of model-based RL is, as Amin pointed out earlier, MPC-based. Um, predictions. So at the inference time, you don't need a policy if you have the world model because you can run trajectory optimization um, based on your... Yeah, but I mean, in order to obtain the world model. Uh, well, obtaining the world model is just a question of, um, you know, I guess having a Having 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 a differentiable differentiable like environment model, um, whether whether you're using a differentiable simulator to begin with. 
um, or you are gathering it from some other expert data. Okay. I don't, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but like building the world model from, from scratch, like you, you, you can't build it up from scratch without having pre-built uh, exploration yeah, I mean model, so I... Uh, yeah, I guess you would use you could use training data for that, but yeah, yeah. I have maybe a question also for for the mm -hmm. the stuff because when uh, you were looking at the wall time that it took for the different, uh, like you compared, uh, they compared PPO and mm -hmm. they compared something else. Uh, oh, the warm starts. Oh uh, yeah, month. warm starts. But I mean, I feel like technically you you should also account then for the world time in the world when you have learned the world models, right? Or if it just feels like, of course, if you give it a warm start or pre-train it, that but you don't use that for you know giving the world time uh, for a given model. That that feels a bit like cheating. But I don't know if I misunderstood how they evaluated yeah so so as i was saying it's no surprise that warm start is a good thing to do um i think I, i'm not sure if i understand you 100 percent, but uh are you wondering whether ppo should have been here somewhere uh no well i was just oh. since uh, uh they compared the world time starting mm -hmm. from zero in both cases but yeah right. the other the, the ones with the world model or something they oh, the didn't policy, take yeah, yeah. yeah they didn't technically start at zero all time because there had been some pre-training yeah that's that's true but I, again the this is a transfer so it's a, on, a, on a completely different data set so you wouldn't expect it to have uh you know much higher than the how should i put it much, much higher than the expert um on mm. that style alone or yeah was there any discussion on why when you uh, started with the world model or, or no so in, you had that plot that we see um where yes, this yellow, exactly. yellow curve yeah so actually both the yellow and the red uh, like how come they seem to stagnate at a lower level than the policy transfer that's a super uh, interesting question. Hmm. Because to me, that feels like it's some kind of optimization problem almost that you end up in some minimum that you can't get out of. But when you initialize the training in the policy case, you still have some more noise or, yeah. Yeah, that's super interesting. So, so you're saying the yellow guy and the red guy, they flatten lower than the green guy. And why is that? Yeah, I, I just, whenever I've tried to also have my own models and, and start with a policy uh, or pre-trained policy or something, uh, like I, I never really see it increase uh, or plateau at a different level. Um, yeah. So I, I just, it just seems a bit funny. I'm, I'm not sure if they're showing average across different seeds here. But that would actually make sense because if, if all the seeds are starting from a really good starting point, then it would make sense for all of them to converge to a more superior optimum. While, you know, the yellow guy might have started over here, over here, over here, and just average performance ends up being this flat line. And maybe their maximum policy is like on par with the green. I don't know. Yeah, okay. Uh, that might also be something. <laughs> okay. Thanks, uh, Yep, for that question. And yeah, another, another thing that I was gonna sort of comment on is, you know, if you think about the worm start uh, world model, this sort of goes back to uh, Nosheba's point about needing the world model to begin with for any sort of uh, model-based uh, learning scenarios. And I see like, the um, advantage here in this case is um, you already have a pretty good starting point of what the dynamics looks like to begin with. So you don't need to learn too much. So your policy can reliably leverage the differentiable dynamics. So that's why the learning gets boosted. That's sort of how I intuitively understand it. All right, anybody else?
So uh, is there any, any other question from the audience? Okay, so I guess I guess that's it. So uh, thank you very much, Nam, for uh, for your great presentation, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, in the Stream Postman and Reading Club. And I wish uh, all of you uh, a great New Year. And yeah, thank you very much. Bye bye. Have a good day.